Welcome to a quick talk on how Ambit might help teams and workers in a lockdown situation. So um, I'm going to go through a very brief reminder about the, the core sort of engine or the axle that carries all the weight in Ambit adaptive mentalization based integrative treatment. And that's the idea of mentalizing. I'm going to say very briefly that Ambit is a, a more systemic and organizational uh, application of mentalizing than simply working face to face with our clients or patients. We mentalize in four directions. And then I'm going to particularly focus on one, one tool that we work with to emphasize and support the development of what Ambit describes as well-connected teams that we see as being as important as the connection that we make with individual clients. Uh, and uh, we hope that this gives people a chance to then, uh, in discussions under the video um, or amongst their teams, to share experiences and share learning, which is another part of Ambit. So let's just remember what mentalizing this function of making sense of our behavior or the behaviors of others uh, on the basis of what might be going on in the mind. What does it look like? when we're actively doing this with our minds and our brains. Well, the best um, analogy is uh, this little dog with his, with his head cocked on one side, trying to look at the world through perhaps a slightly different perspective. Curiosity is one of the features that you'd see in somebody who's actively mentalizing. It could, could be curiosity about themselves. Why am I doing the things that I'm doing? Why am I saying this? Why, why am I behaving like this? or curiosity about the other person. I wonder why you're behaving in this way. I wonder what's gone on in your life in the last few hours before this, or perhaps in the years previously, that have made this an issue. Not knowing uh, is, is one of the features of mentalizing. It's the knowledge that our minds are opaque. They're like light bulbs that are frosted rather than clear. We can see that things are going on in somebody else's mind and often in, even in our own mind, but we can't be absolutely clear what that is. We can only wonder and try to enrich our understanding on the basis that that's helpful. People who are mentalizing actively are aware of the fact that emotion in the here and now, what we call affect, has an impact and it actually makes it harder to mentalize when there's a lot of emotion. People who are mentalizing create coherent stories, a narrative about what makes sense of why I came to behave in the way that I did or, or, or you. And finally, when mentalizing is active is when we can often see humor, the comedy of errors, as Shakespeare called it. People misunderstand other people. It's what we are above anything else. We're, we're misunderstanding machines. And mentalizing is the coming to understand our misunderstandings is a rather nice way of putting it. So these are some of the clues that this part of the brain, uh, the prefrontal cortex, is activated at that time. The other thing that I think is critical about mentalizing and helpful for us workers is that mentalizing by design, evolutionarily, is fragile. <coughs> it's a balancing act. But when we get it right, it can be very helpful, but it takes a lot of patience and work, and um, it's a slow form of thinking. So another way of looking at that is you can either have your mentalizing on and your stress and arousal systems rather calm, or your stress and arousal systems switch on, perhaps in response to a tiger, at which point this slow, balanced, perspective-taking, wondering, curiosity, not knowing, um, is, is of very little use to you. You don't want that when there's a tiger approaching you. What you want is high levels of certainty that are very quick and action, generally. And there is another form of non-mentalizing that we identify, which we call the pretend mode. Chosen mode of non-mentalizing by many mental health pro professionals, I dare to add. Uh, the ostrich with its head in the sand. But it's a really a sort of falling in love with words and ideas without 
connecting with you, who's perhaps listening to this talk and thinking, how the hell does this relate to me in a kind of COVID lockdown situation where I'm trying to work from home using online means and I'm feeling kind of lonely and anxious and all the things. So pretend mode might be too many words. They may be correct, but they just may not be connecting you to me in any kind of way that feels real. And this happens certainly in our clients, our patients, um, but definitely in us too. Workers are brought together with their clients in the fact that for all of us, mentalizing is a fragile um, function of our minds. So that's a really big emphasis in AMBIT that really looks very much at how we can at least do the best of maintaining our own mentalizing. And that brings us on to really this sort of key bit that I want to think about with AMBIT in um, uh, these particular times when teams are particularly perhaps feeling more isolated than what they would be. We know that uh, mentalizing happens in brains. It's a prefrontal cortex activity. We know that it happens in brains that develop in secure relationships where they get a bit of to and fro with the mum. The mum imagining the mind of her child and showing her that child's mind as she imagines it in her face, in the, in the way that she says it, what we call marked mirroring in the research, enables the child to, if you like, learn about who they are and what their mind is, their sense of agency, through seeing themselves or their mind reflected in their mother's mind. But as much as that, we want to emphasise that mentalising is a social capacity, because the mother can only do that of her child as she's exhausted, she didn't sleep well, her partner's out to work, um, she's trying to juggle a toddler with a, perhaps another pregnancy, she's feeling maybe a little bit kind of exhausted. She can only do that kind of sensitive thinking insofar as she's got other people, perhaps her own mother, a sister, an aunt, a friend, maybe a health visitor, maybe a professional, who can do that of her and kind of look at her and say, oh, well, yeah, this is exhausting. I don't blame you for feeling absolutely kind of, you know, slightly losing your temper with your child. You know, these are understandable things. So mentalizing is a function of our own network. We can only mentalize the other in as much as we have people who are mentalizing us enough. And that's connection, uh, the, this notion of well-connectedness that I want to come on to. I'm not going to go right round the ambit wheel, but I just focus on the fact that there's mentalizing right at the center, and that rather than focusing all our sort of mentalizing energy upwards towards the work with our clients, Ambit says that unless you're filling all four of those quadrants with something that looks like the sort of energetic work of mentalizing, working with your team, creating a team that is well connected to each other, that mentalizes each other, that takes each other's minds as seriously as we take the minds of our client, and working with our networks, working with the other professionals, the other agencies that sometimes their work doesn't make so much sense to us and working in ways that kind of are mentalizing towards these professionals rather than blaming or irritable or um, uh, uh, frankly divisive or disintegrating as we might say and then finally the bottom quadrant you know learning at work learning and mentalizing are closely connected and trying to balance the need to be respectful of where there is evidence that has been sort of evaluated and is trustworthy, and to, to balance that with the, the, the immediate respect for one's local practice and expertise and the local practice and expertise that you meet with other professionals. So AMBIT is, a, is a, a, really a, a much more global, systemic or organisational application of mentalising. Thinking about this well-connected team brings us to one of the, the phrases that we use in AMBIT, the notion of the team around the worker. Now, the conventional model of develop, delivering services is what we know as the team around the child or the team around the family, the team around the client. Um, this is, if you like, a rather industrial way of uh, delivering help, focusing on individual practitioners' roles, skills, responsibilities. And the complement to this, 
the complement is what we would call the team around the worker. And here we're more interested in looking at the network of, in terms of relationships and looking at the network through the eyes of this young person or family, the client. What do they see? Who would they see as the key trusted worker? Not the key worker as a, as a role, but the key worker as who's key in their mind? Who gets them? Where is, to use a phrase from the research, the epistemic trust in, the, in, in their experience of this network? These are the same professionals. It's the same network. It's just a different lens for looking at the same network. And in this situation, the key or trusted worker is that person who's out front. And just as mountaineers have a strong discipline of how they talk to the person who's holding their rope, how they communicate about risk, about kind of, uh, uh, the, the kind of safety mechanisms um, with each other, um, just as, uh, as, as that is, we think that the communication between workers who, who hold our rope is critically important. And it's that that I want to briefly now finish off with, which we think that Ambit has something to communicate with. As you talk about the kind of communications you have uh, down the phone on video conferences with your colleagues. So we often use this image of ripples in a pond. Where the stone strikes is where the anxiety is. Often as a worker, it can feel like we're sort of sinking a little bit. Uh, about something that we're uncertain about, that we're frankly very worried about. Um, the question for us is, how do we, from the chaos in the middle, get some information out to people who are perhaps a little further out, uh, a little further away from the impact of that uh, um, chaos, where perhaps the ripples are forming and that can be seen a little bit more pattern? How do we pass that information out? And we've developed over the years four steps that I think a lot of teams that we've trained in Ambit have found really helpful. Um, I hesitate to use the word transformational, but um, I think in at times it can be. Um, that really, if you like, work as the landing lights for an effective conversation where I get help to a colleague of mine who's perhaps in the middle of the pond um, and get something useful back to them without me jumping in to the pond and both of us floundering around at the same time. So I want to talk through those four steps and then we'll finish off there because we think that these steps in a telephone conversation or a video conversation with a team member just give a slightly higher likelihood that you mentalize each other and that you restore each other's mentalizing. So the first step is the step that in most ordinary help-seeking conversations I'm going to venture to suggest is most often left out. We call it marking the task. What that means is broadcasting, if you like, what would an effective end to this conversation look like if you, the person I'm seeking help from, actually ended up giving me something that was helpful. So we kind of def try and define the end point of the conversation before we get into the meat of, what the, of, of the conversation. Um, why am I coming to you for help? It forces me as a help seeker, if I'm going to mark a task for you who I'm coming to help with, to mentalise myself, to stop and think, hang on a moment, why am I asking you this question? What do I really want from you? What would it look like or feel like if you gave me the help that I've sort of, I feel driven to kind of come to? Um, and you could be quite practical in marking the task, could you? How, how long have we got? Is this a practical time and place to do this? Do we need to set aside more time? Because actually this is a bigger task. Once the task is clear, then you tell the story. We call it state the case. And the state the case can wander around a bit because the stories that we get involved in are often very complicated. And part of thinking together this four-step dance involves, if you like, a contracting in by the, the helper and the help seeker to the helper being kind of given a bit of permission to be tough. I'm going to be tough if you come to me in that I won't even let you start telling me the story until I'm clear that I've understood the task. If I don't feel I've really understood what you're coming for, you haven't marked the task, 
I won't let you go forward. And likewise, when you are telling the story in this form of very real-time conversation, I'm going to hold you to some boundaries. I want you to stick to the bones of the story. It's very tempting when we're anxious to get a bit over-inclusive, to get a little bit wandery, to kind of get into storytelling, which, to remember those forms of non mentalizing is a little bit like the ostrich, the pretend mode. All I need to do is tell you all the words about this story, and somehow this will make it all right. We need to hold to the fact that I want to get you somewhere helpful in the time we've got allocated. So I may occasionally interrupt you and say, is this on the bones of the, of the, of the question that you wanted me to help with, or the dilemma that you had, or are we getting a little bit into uh, storytelling? Once the, the case has been sort of stated, then we move to the third step, which is deliberately slower. I, if I'm in face-to-face -face contact with somebody, I change my posture. I try and even change my tone of voice. Mentalising is something that happens in a state of slightly more calm um, and is quieter. Now, we've put a photograph up here from the airline safety manuals, um, which it involves that part of the safety talk when they say, you know, if oxygen disappears, masks will fall from the ceiling. And then they say this wonderful phrase, if you're in charge of somebody else, such as a child, be sure to place your own mask before attempting to place theirs. And the reason for this is that if you don't, you'll tend to pass out and everybody dies, to be brutal. Um, and mentalising is a pretty good analogy for oxygen. It's important that the first person we get mentalising is our colleague who's come to us for help. Not that we get all clever, and if you again, slightly pretend mode, mentalising the client, mentalising their family, mentalising other workers in the picture. The only person who's present with me is the person who's come to help, come for help from me. And so I want to first of all ensure that I, as the helper, have tried to mentalise the worker first. And that's the critical bit. And it's only when I've mentalised them that we might then be able to together mentalise a little bit about some of the other players in the dilemma, the young person or client, uh, other, other workers involved, you know, whoever else is involved. But we try and do that in a more collaborative way, again, holding this kind of, kind of almost relaxed position that mentalising happens as if there isn't an end. But there is an end to these conversations. We call it return to purpose. And what we want to bring the conversation to an end is to go back to remind the help seeker about what their task was and to, if you like, invite them to think, first of all, you know, what, what, what comes out of the reflections that we've had about you and about your dilemma and about perhaps the players in your, in your, in your story that you've brought. Um, it may be at that point that I invite them, if they want, to ask me whether I've got thoughts from my position sitting on the bank of, the, of, of this problem, not being right in the middle of it, um, that I offer that. But we're trying to wrap this conversation up in something quite practical and pragmatic. So this is no different from any conversation that you ever have, except that it's a little bit more disciplined. We define what we're trying to do based on what you, the help seeker, are bringing as the dilemma. And we don't start the actual conversation until I, the helper, have a fairly clear idea in my mind that I understand the kind of help that you're after. I'm trying to offer a bread rather than a stone um, if what you're asking for is bread. Um, so here are the four steps sort of written out in a little bit more uh, uh, detail. And that's really what I would um, uh, invite people who are working in teams to try to sort of share this with your team colleagues so that you try using this format for help seeking on the phone, on video calls, about the work that you're doing, and see whether this enables you to really address each other's minds as seriously as you address the minds of your clients, who quite rightly, you want to be in the most thoughtful, uh, uh, balanced position, to balance, if you like, the reflective thinking with the need at times for clear action. 
Sometimes we do too much reflecting when we should be doing action. Sometimes we do too much action when a little bit more reflecting would have focused and uh, 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 got that action better directed. And mentalizing is what helps us, if you like, find that right balance between reflection and action. The one which can fall into a kind of pretend mode, too much reflection, and too much action without reflection is what we call the teleological mode, a kind of quick fix thinking. I'll just do something that actually is about making me feel less anxious rather than doing something that's really helpful. So I really hope that that is um, a helpful uh, brief account of one of the techniques from Ambit that we use in all our help-seeking conversations between colleagues in a team as a way of helping you stay connected. Thank you very much indeed.